And it's all yours, Sabrina. Okay. Hey, everybody. Dr. Gavin Jones is a research ecologist with Rocky Mountain Research Station and an assistant professor in the biology department at the University of New Mexico. Gavin earned his MS and PhD at the University of Wisconsin-Madison under the supervision of Dr. Zach Peary. He is also an associate editor at the Journal of Wildlife Management and Fire Ecology. His research advances understanding of how to conserve species and biodiversity in a rapidly changing world. Much of his past and ongoing work focuses on how wildlife respond to fire and forest management and the ecology and conservation of wildlife and fire prone ecosystems. In tonight's presentation, we'll learn about the ecology of spotted owls, the history of conflicts surrounding management of their habitat, and a new conservation conflict involving wildfire, forest restoration, and spotted owl conservation. Dr. Jones will cover recent scientific evidence that will inform long-term conservation of the California spotted owl and restoration of fire-suppressed dry forests. With that, Gavin. Okay, thank you, Sabrina, for that introduction. Can you hear me loud and clear over there on the, across the waves? Can hear you. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. It's an honor to be joining you, uh, even if it is from afar. Um, I really wish that I could be there in person. I do make my occasional journey out west, and so um, I really uh, would love to, to be able to be hanging out with you in person, as I, I know we all would rather be hanging out in person these days. But I'm very excited to meet with you today and share a little bit about uh, some of the science that I've been involved in in the past uh, 10 years, but primarily in the, in the recent uh, several uh, recent years trying to understand uh, how wildfire, especially these, these kind of new mega fires that we've been seeing more of in, in uh, California and throughout the West, how these big severe fires are, are influencing uh, wildlife uh, and particularly the spotted owl, which I've spent most of my career uh, studying up into this point. So tonight I'm gonna be talking about the burning issue of spotted owls and wildfire. And I sincerely hope you enjoy this talk. And I, uh, I hope uh, we could have a nice discussion at the end as well. <clears throat> so wildfire, we are entering a new normal. This is the age of megafires. <laughs> Every year we have new records, uh, fire records that are broken in terms of size, severity, and impacts to people. Uh, for example, the, the, the 2019 and 2020 Australia fires uh, burned almost 100,000 square kilometers. So, you know, that's uh, a bit of a strange metric to try to wrap your head around, but that's about 50 times bigger than California's largest wildfires uh, and five times the size of the 2019 fires in Amazon in, in, that occurred in the Amazon. Um, the point is, and this is just one example in one part of the globe in, in Australia, uh, but everywhere around the world, we're seeing changes in how fires are burning across our forests and across our, uh, these natural landscapes that we love. And this, uh, this photo here is a pretty striking one from, uh, taken from the air or rather from space. This is the New Year's Eve wildfire that occurred in, in New South Wales, Australia uh, on New Year's Eve in, in 2019. So uh, the Australia fires and, and all fires across the globe, they have important impacts to wildlife habitat. Uh, and here's some, some cute cuddly kangaroos who uh, were trying to figure out what to do in the aftermath of one of these Australia wildfires. Um, wildfire is a, is a major agent of change for ecosystems and the wildlife that inhabit them, which means that wildfire, it, it, uh, it alters uh, vegetation, it alters forests, um, it, it can, you know, burn them up and leave them crispy or it can restore them and regenerate them. And there's all sorts of impacts that wildfire can have uh, for the habitat that wildlife depend on. And fire giveth and fire taketh away. It's a creator and a destroyer of, of habitat. And it's the primary agent of disruption in, in many terrestrial ecosystems. So in every square inch of vegetated land on planet Earth, fire is, it plays a role in some way. Uh, and it, in many 
places and particularly in the Western US, it's really the primary agent of change. It's what, it's what makes the landscapes that we live in so dynamic. And this photo here is of a, uh, an adult and a juvenile California spotted owl in one of our study areas in, in California. Um, and I love this photo because I think it, it embodies this tension of fire creating and destroying. Because here we have uh, a, a, a mother, this is a female, a mother and her, and her nestling uh, spotted owl that are uh, nesting uh, and you know, fledging within this burned out snag or the standing dead tree. And we actually know that this tree, it li it's likely that it burned about 90 years before this nesting uh, or this photo was taken. And in that time, you've got this green forest growing around in the background. Uh, and so fire can create really critical structures that are important for wildlife like the spotted owl. But if you go, if you, if you just take a little stroll from where this photo was taken about, oh, half a mile uh, uh, west, you see this. And this is the aftermath of the 2014 King Fire. And this is actually, uh, this was also taken in a, in a nest stand. This was uh, um, an area that just prior to the 2014 King Fire, we had uh, nesting spotted owls. And uh, now, this is no longer suitable nesting habitat for the owls. So we, we have fire both as creating nesting habitat and also destroying it. And so the point here is that it's complex and it's always interesting and complicated uh, to try and, and understand uh, how and in what ways uh, fire um, influences the wildlife and the birds that, that we love so much. <clears throat> so um, being from California, or at least being residents of California, most of you who are on this call, I'm, I'm sure many of you are familiar uh, with the spotted owl, which I'm gonna spend the rest of this time talking about. Um, so the spotted owl over here on the right, this is a photo taken on our uh, one of our study areas in the central Sierra Nevada uh, on the El Dorado National Forest. Uh, this is uh, a, an adult spotted owl um, hanging out in a beautiful Pacific Madrone tree behind it, you see there. Um, but the spotted owl has long been known for its association with this kind of what we call old forest or old growth or mature forest. There's a lot of different ways you can, a lot of different names for it. Um, but it's, it's typically this, you know, forests that have uh, been around for quite some time, have been around long enough where you have some trees that are old enough to die and that have decayed and have fallen to the ground. And um, you really have these kind of dark, cool microclimates in these forests where spotted owls live. And spotted owls also have long been known for their nesting in very large, uh, old, and commercially valuable trees. So trees that, uh, you know, if we were to cut and sell them, they'd be worth quite a bit of money. Uh, and so this, uh, this habitat association of the spotted owl, uh, along with the economic value of, of, that, of those habitats, have for many decades caused conflict uh, between people uh, regarding how their habitats should or can be managed. So I'm gonna give you just a very, very brief history of the spotted owl conflict, or what, I, what I'm calling the spotted owl conflict, and how it's evolved through time, although some of you may be familiar. This is, this is a fun slide. If you Google spotted owl conflict, you'll see all sorts of silly things uh, on, on the internet. Um, but back in the, in the you know, starting in the, in the 80s and really coming to a head in the 90s, um, there, were, there were a lot of, of very public and very uh, fierce conflict between, uh, you know, if we were to simplify the story between sort of loggers and environmentalists. These were sort of the two camps that viewed how we should treat spotted owl habitat quite differently. Uh, so you see here bumper sticker, save a logger, eat an owl. Uh, Time Magazine in 1993, I believe, is on my birthday in 1993, um, uh, when they came out with this cover here, who gives a hoot uh, about the spotted owl, you know, making national news. Um, down here on the left, you know, this is sort of a tongue in cheek uh, joke here, you know, the logging industry's alternative to show its concern for the spotted owl, uh, <clears throat> you know, a, a patch of clear cut stumps with some bird feeders in it. Um, 
And then of course, uh, I love spotted owls, sable lager, eaten owl, fried, they taste like chicken. Um, so the point here is, is, you know, not just to make you kind of chuckle, although that's definitely a benefit. Um, but the, the point here is that there's a lot of really serious um, uh, feelings about, about spotted owls. Um, they're quite controversial uh, amongst many different groups and stakeholders. Um, but really underscoring all of this is that, uh, uh, you know, th this is a real people issue. Uh, ultimately, the conflicts are always between people. Conflicts are never between people and, you know, the owl, for example. It's how we and different people view um, how spotted owls should or could be managed or how their habitat should or could change. Um, so historically, it was really this kind of, uh, you know, loggers versus environmentalist type of divide um, over spotted owls, um, over saving their, you know, large old uh, uh, nesting trees uh, that they depend on. And in the early 1990s, this led to some pretty serious um, uh, policy, some federal policy, uh, including but not limited to the, the Northwest Forest Plan, which applied to a very large area in the Pacific Northwest um, across uh, uh, Washington, Oregon, and, and Northwestern California. Uh, and the Northwest Forest Plan was essentially um, plan to, to set aside reserves for spotted owl habitat uh, to, um, to conserve their, their dwindling or their remaining uh, uh, valuable old growth habitat, uh, but do so in a way that hopefully would also provide for some natural resource use and, and, and timber uh, extraction. Um, and to be quite honest, because of the, the Northwest Forest Plan and several other similar pieces of legislation, including uh, the listing of the, of the spotted owl, the northern and the Mexican subspecies on the, under the Endangered Species Act, um, and, and several other related policies, we've, we've essentially stopped large tree logging uh, on, on public lands, on, on federal lands, you know, U.S. Forest Service, National Park, uh, you know, other, other uh, public lands. Uh, Logging of very large old trees does not happen like it like it used to, um, and and however the conflict has not stopped, and that's what I'm going to start getting into now a little bit because the, while that original conflict that you may be familiar with uh, with respect to the spotted owl, while that kind of ended and fizzled out or or at least um, uh, uh, tapered enough to uh, um, for folks to coexist or at least get by. Um, the threats have changed and now the conflict has changed too. So there's still conflict, but it's, a, it's quite a different one. And so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that now. So I, I'm gonna show you this, this kind of neat little cartoon here. This is, um, this is showing the cycle of, uh, of a natural fire regime in seasonally dry forests of the Western US. So seasonally dry, what I mean by that is these are forests where um, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty cold and, and, and wet in the, in the wintertime. In the summer, it's, it's quite warm and dry. So the Sierra Nevada is a good example of this. The San Bern, many of the forests in the San Bernardino Mountains are characterized by this as well. Uh, the, the coastal range uh, in, in California, it, it's not so much a seasonally dry forest, uh, more of a wet forest. But in seasonally dry forests, uh, the, uh, the natural fire regime looks something like this. Uh, you know, typically you have a forest that is pretty low density. You don't have a lot of trees. Uh, you have them kind of spaced out and clumped. And fire happens so frequently because these forests are so dry and ignitions, lightning are so common. But you have fire burn at a very high frequency. And, you know, every couple of years you have fire burning through a, a given area. And that regular uh, frequent fire uh, in the in these forests, it, it essentially cleans out this understory. It kills a lot of the smaller trees, and it leaves uh, this post-fire uh, landscape that uh, that has it, it continues to have these overstory or these larger canopy trees and a relatively open uh, understory. So this is what's natural in a lot of these forests that uh, spotted owls inhabit in in uh, the western U.S. However. In the past century uh, or more, we've been quite effective at suppressing fires. Um, and so when, when fires burned over the past hundred years, we 
for the most part, put them out. And the consequence of that is we have a really changed forest structure. So we have a lot more small trees in the understory of these forests, which is not natural, uh, not a natural structure. And when fires do burn, which we have lots of opportunities for ignition still, it tends uh, to more often kill the overstory and create these larger patches of dead trees. And this is not natural for these kinds of forests. Um, and uh, so this is, this is a real problem, obviously for, uh, for forest conservation, but also for the wildlife species that, that inhabit them, these new fire regimes that are killing larger areas of, of forest. And so just to give you a better sense or convince you that we, that we do, uh, that fire suppression really made a difference to these landscapes, I wanna show you a couple of these repeated panoramic photos, um, just showing how much landscapes can change in a pretty short period of time. So, so these are, all of these photos, I'm gonna show you in the next three si slides, you've got a black and white photo showing some historical photo. This one here, this was taken in, in Washington. Um, uh, uh, in uh, near Bald Mountain um, in, in, in Washington. And then on the bottom, you've got the same exact uh, you know, photo taken in the same exact place, but in uh, you know, a more recent uh, year. So here's 2014, same photo taken from the same place. You can, one of the things you'll notice right away, looking at a photo like this, is uh, historically you had a lot more sort of heterogeneity or variety in clumps and patchiness in the forest. You had some openings here, some openings there. Um, and and in, if you kind of look in the right places, you see kind of a lower density of trees on the landscape. Now look down at the bottom photo and you see pretty much wall to wall. It's, it's hard to find uh, an open patch uh, that's, that, and even the places that do have trees, there are very high density of trees. Here's another photo. This is taken from, uh, from the Yosemite in, in, in California. Photo here taken in 1899 on the left. I've got a photo taken, this cut off here. I believe this is like uh, 2020 or 2019 or something like that uh, here on the right. Um, so again, a great increase in tree densities of pretty much a full loss of these kind of openings. Um, so, so just a lot less of variety in terms of this forest structure on the landscape. Just pretty homogenous wall-to-wall -wall, uh, uh, trees here. here. Here's another example. Um, let's see, this, this, was, this is a photo also taken from Washington for, from some dry east side forests in, in, in Washington. Um, again, the top photo you see there's some kind of bald, some patches, some openings, quite a bit of variety in, in, in the forest. Although you do see some areas where there's, there's quite a bit of, of, uh, of, of high density of forest, but down here on the bottom, it's pretty difficult to find uh, anywhere where you have kind of an opening um, and a, a, a pretty high density of trees in all the places that seem to be forested. So uh, again, in these types of forests, the consequence of this structural change of this increase in, in tree density is that when fires do burn, you get things like this. So this is, this is from the Blue Fire in 2001 in Modoc County in California. This is a photo taken 15 years after a, a wildfire burned through. And uh, you know you see pretty much 100% mortality in the trees. So there are almost no live trees in this photo, except a couple here and there in the background. Um, and uh, the, the understory is completely dominated by shrubs. So this is a deer brush here uh, uh, in the understory that if you were to try to walk through this, it, this would be above your head. Um, so this is quite tall shrubs. Um, and uh, the, the effect of, of this kind of conversion to a shrubland is it's pretty persistent. So it's going to be really difficult, at least even in, in my lifetime, for this uh, patch of, of uh, land to regenerate to forest. This is going to be a pretty persistent shrub field uh, for the foreseeable future. This is something we call ecological type conversion. When you have a, a disturbance event like a fire that converts everything from a forest to a shrubland or a grassland or something like that. Here's another example here. This is uh, uh, from uh, near Flagstaff, uh, Arizona, uh, Arizona, um, Coconino County, the Horseshoe Fire from 1996. This photo was taken 17 years after the fire burned. A lot of the standing dead trees that burn in the fire have since fallen. But you see, this is a grassland now. This is no longer a forest. 
Um, those are just two examples there. But uh, so coming back to the owl, you know, and considering what this means for the owl, of course, the owl depends on, on forests, uh, you know, for its, its nesting and roosting and breeding and all that kind of stuff. And certain kinds of forests, these older forests. Um, and I mentioned that the conflict has now changed because as I was showing you in those photos, it, it becomes clear, or I hope it should, that um, uh, if we want to have uh, forests in the future in a lot of areas, we need to do something in order to stop these big severe fires from converting forest to non-forest. And so one of the ways we can do that is through forest restoration and fuels reduction, forest thinning. Um, and so here on the right, just some examples, you know, prescribed burning is one of the ways we can reduce fuels and reintroduce fire in the landscape. And also through tree removal, through removing small and medium sized trees that have grown up in this era of fire suppression that create these, these conditions that are quite flammable. So this new conflict is actually that of forest restoration versus spotted owl conservation. I'm gonna explain this a little more now. So this is the new conservation conflict uh, with spotted owls. I'm gonna show you a few graphs and figures here. I'll walk you through them. Um, so, uh, the concern here is that you know we've got our spotted owl. Here's our population of spotted owls. This is time on going from left to right, uh, population size on uh, going uh, from uh, bottom to top here. So you know we have the spotted owl population that might be bumping up and down through time, um, and we've got forests that are quite fire suppressed that are are dense and flammable. When fires come along. We, we might expect there to be a loss of forest habitat and for owls to be negatively affected, right? Um, but the problem is that uh, treating forests or thinning or removing some of the trees from the landscape, that might also, that actually might also harm owls in the short term. You might have, you might come in and do some cutting or do some burning and remove some of the, the, the forest uh, and, and alter some of the forest structure. And there's this idea that doing that is actually going to exacerbate or worsen these long-term declines that we've been seeing in the spotted owl. However, what happens after you treat the forest is really of greatest interest here. You know, if you treat the forest, you may have these short-term impacts, but potentially the forest might be more resilient when fire and we may not see a total loss, but rather we would see a maintenance of some forest structure, even though there may have been this short-term impact of treatment uh, to so this, this new conflict sounds these questions about whether it's worth it to treat forests or how damaging treating forests is to owls in the short term in terms of altering their habitat. Um, but uh, you know, doing nothing is also a decision and kind of leaving these fire suppressed forests as they are leave us vulnerable to these bigger losses and potentially more catastrophic losses of, of spotted owl habitat. So this is this, this new conflict or disagreement between what is the best route to take for spotted owls. In terms of managing their habitat. One of the big questions is how does severe fire impact spotted owls? So spotted owls, uh, you know, evolved in a landscape that was full of fire. Fire has always burned in the Sierra Nevada and has always burned in, in the forests that they live in. Um, but how they respond to these new kinds of fires that we're seeing, these mega fires, these very large severe fires, that's an open question and it's something that we don't we haven't totally understood yet, but may, may provide some really important information to resolving this conflict, and figuring out how to move forward and conserving their habitat. So here's another photo of a, of a, a landscape that experienced a lot of, of uh, severe fire. This was a photo taken on one of my study areas in central Sierra Nevada. This was part of the 2014 King Fire that burned on the El Dorado and, and Tahoe National Forests in September and October of 2014. You can see here, you know, uh, pretty much wall to wall uh, mortality or, or you know, uh, tree death following this fire. Um, down here on the bottom, this is the Rubicon River. Uh, this was one of the really most beautiful uh, 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 drainages or, or uh, uh, canyons uh, that I had ever seen and that I ever set foot in before this, this fire burned through. So it's quite difficult to see this. But our, our interest was trying to understand what this fire might have done to the spotted owls in that area. So uh, we conducted what's called a before after control impact study. And you can think about this as a natural experiment. So 
Uh, I'm showing you here this colorful blob. This is an outline of the King Fire. So the, the reddest areas here, these are the areas that burned at high severity where most of the trees were killed. We've got some kind of yellowy orange areas that burned at moderate severity. Some of the trees were killed in the fire. And then the blue areas and the gray areas, those are places that either burned at low severity. So a fire burned through, but didn't really change the forest that much, kind of burned in the upper story. Or uh, the gray areas are places that didn't actually burn at all, but were within this King Fire footprint. Uh, these little uh, dots here I'm showing you, these are spotted owl territories. So these are places that we've been studying spotted owls for almost 20, actually almost 30 years, excuse me, over 30 years. Um, we've been tracking and studying spotted owl survival and reproduction and behavior uh, in this area for almost, uh, for over three decades. Um, and then this little uh, dashed uh, uh, shape here. This is just the boundary of, of, of uh, sort of one of our study areas. But the point here is that this King Fire burned through one of our long-term demographic studies of spotted owls. And it gave us the opportunity to try and understand uh, what the impacts of fire might be. Because, we, you know, in an experiment, you have, you have a treatment and you have a control, right? So you, you, you uh, it's kind of, you give the medicine to one group and you don't give the medicine to the other group and you see what happens. It's kind of the same here. But in, in this case, the fire burned through part of our study area, burned through some of the owl territories and didn't burn through others. And we also had several decades of data before the fire burned to try and figure out uh, what the impact of this fire uh, was uh, or were on, on spotted owls. So here I'm showing you a graph and this graph, it goes from left to right. This is going through time. So on the left, it's early 1990s going through uh, 2020 here on the very far right. Uh, up and down here, this is the proportion of the sites in this study area over here on the left that were occupied by spotted owls. And so what I'm showing you here is in these different colors, you have the different groups of territories. So the red dots, these are, this is the sort of trend or the trajectory of territories that ended up being burned quite severely in the King Fire. And the other, uh, the lighter red, this is territories that burned a little bit in the King Fire, but not so much. And then the gray uh, dots, these are territories that, um, that didn't burn at all. And so what you see here is through time from the early 1990s through about 2013 or 2014, there's kind of this long, slow decline in our owl population going from around 80% to around 60% of the territories being occupied. But when the King Fire burned along, shown by this little symbol here, we saw a pretty uh, steep and dramatic decline uh, in the, uh, uh, the occupancy rates of, the, of those territories that were uh, burned most severely. So basically those, these territories here in the middle of this, uh, this picture on the left, these are the ones that became unoccupied after the King Fire burned through. So the owls didn't stick around. But for those, the territories that burned, that did experience some fire, these pink dots here, after the King Fire, they, they more or less stayed steady. Uh, um, and the ones that did not burn stayed steady as well. So the point here is that uh, it's really the, those most severely burned uh, owl territories that were abandoned by owls after the fire. And the ones that burned a little bit or didn't burn at all did just fine. So I'm gonna show you one other kind of neat figure here. This is an aerial photo. So these are two aerial photos uh, looking up, uh, looking down from the sky at two spotted owl territories that I'll call territory A and territory B. You can kind of ignore these little numbers here, but the point is that before the fire, this is what these two territories looked like. And in fact, these territories were of very similar quality. The, the, you saw owls reproducing there and occurring there at pretty similar rates prior to the fire. So really similar in a lot of ways. Uh, high quality territories. This is an aerial photo after the fire. So this top territory, it, it did experience fire, in fact, across 100% of its area. But you see some of the places we have maintained canopy, other places uh, uh, it burned you know, uh, a little more of the vegetation. We also see some of those areas were already open before the fire. Um, and this bottom territory, it burned entirely and there's almost no uh, trees, no live trees left uh, as you can uh, maybe see if you squint a little bit, but this is pretty much 100% tree mortality here in this bottom uh, 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 territory. 
And these numbers that I'm showing you here, this is sort of some index of habitat quality going from zero to one. So the closer this number is to one, the better the territory is. So this, this territory is pretty good even after the fire, uh, even though it experienced quite a bit of fire. And this one is, is almost down to zero. So uh, uh, basically we didn't see owls in this territory at all after the fire, whereas this territory uh, continued to be occupied for six years uh, following the King Fire. And what's the difference between these two territories in terms of how they burn? Well, it all has to do with the burn severity and how that kind of played out across the territory. So this top territory, you see a lot of different colors in this kind of mosaic pattern across the territory. So some places burn at low severity, some at medium, some at high, and it's all kind of mixed together. Uh, and so that ends up being quite good for owls. The owls continue to occupy this territory and reproduce there. This bottom territory, the, the color here you see is mostly red, which indicates high severity or 100% or mortality of trees. So most of this territory burns severely, and that is why we didn't see uh, owls uh, continue to occupy that site. And one of the, I'll introduce kind of a fun buzzword that I'm going to use a couple more times here, which is pyrodiversity. And this is the idea of, uh, of fire characteristics that are very variable across space. And so in this top territory, we see very high pyrodiversity. So a lot of different uh, burn effects, low severity, moderate, high, all kind of intermixed in one area. So this is a high pyrodiversity uh, territory or a territory with high pyrodiversity. Whereas the one on the bottom, it's quite low in terms of its pyrodiversity because it's mostly made up by this one class of high severity fire. And so at least in terms of how the King Fire and how these large mega fires may impact owls, this is a pretty good indicator that when fires burn more like this, they, you know, when they affect owl habitat like they do here in the bottom, it's not gonna be so good for owls. But if we do have fire burning and more of a mixture of burn severities, that's good actually for the spotted owls. And it ends up um, uh, actually reinforcing the resilience of those forests to future fire as well. So in addition to studying um, these uh, sort of population effects or how these big fires affect these big populations, we've also kind of scratched the surface on the nitty gritty details here. So how, how are individual owls uh, interacting with these burned landscapes? And so here's a photo of me from 2017. This is me uh, uh, capturing a, a, an adult California spotted owl. I'm, I'm putting a little GPS backpack on it got little straps around at the base of its wings, a very light seven gram uh, GPS tag on the back that collects uh, data throughout the breeding season on where it is. And then I've got just some, some tools here that I'm using to, to kind of uh, uh, fasten that GPS tag. But we've tagged, um, we've tagged about 50 or 60 spotted owls in uh, burned areas in California over the past several years across both national forests and national parks, ranging from the El Dorado, Tahoe, now we've got tags down in the San Bernardino National uh, Forest um, and uh, even in Yosemite and Kings Canyon and other national parks as, as well. So we're really learning quite a bit about these owls from these GPS studies. And one of the main takeaways from all of our studies is that spotted owls in these post-fire landscapes, they really tend to prefer small and complex uh, patches of severely burned forest. So uh, I mentioned a, a moment ago that, you know, this idea of pyrodiversity, right? So when you have really big patches of severely burned forest, owls don't seem to like that. But when you have kind of small patches of severely burned forest or forest that has been killed by fire, they actually uh, tend to spend quite a bit of time there. And so here's some, some aerial photos or aerial images of, um, of two owls that we tagged. So uh, owl A and owl B here on the left and right. On the left here, so what I'm showing you, this, this is a satellite uh, image here. You, see, you can see forest and openings and things like that. Um, these uh, uh, yellow plus marks, these are individual GPS locations that we collected from, from spotted owl, from the spotted owl over the breeding season. Um, and then you see here in this gray kind of uh, shaded color, this is the boundary of the 2014 King Fire. And then the red areas, these are the places where we had uh, you know, canopy mortality or you know, the fire ended up killing uh, uh, patches of trees. 
So this particular owl, you can see, spent quite a bit of its time in this one single patch that was actually very kind of elongated and complex and small in size. Um, and one of the reasons we think that they like these smaller patches is because it creates some openings for some of their prey, like wood rats um, and other critters that might be crawling around on the ground or may be exposed in some of these open areas that are created by fire. Um, while at the same time providing some concealment for them because they, they kind of hide along the edges of the green forest, uh, perch and wait uh, for their prey to come through. Uh, whereas over here on the right, you see, um, here's another owl, uh, these, these uh, plus signs again showing its locations, um, uh, completely avoided this large, very large severe fire patch uh, on the right here, uh, didn't even go into it at all. Um, whereas it, it did spend some time in some of these smaller patches um, of severely burned forest or, or uh, a fire killed forest within its, its home range. So, you know, the, the question of whether severe fire is good or bad for spotted owls, it really depends on what kind of severe fire it is. If it's a big, big patch, it's not so good. If it's a, kind of a nice small patch, it, they actually really like that. So it all depends on that, that, um, that kind of uh, spatial arrangement and size. So all of this uh, points again to this idea of pyrodiversity. So this is this is would again be a, an example that I, I brought up with a small patch of severely burned forest surrounded by other kinds of fire. Um, this is a this is a, an area we might uh, characterize as having high pyrodiversity. So here, here's a, just an example of what that looks like on the ground. So here's a little patch of um, forest that was burned completely here in this this kind of uh, blackened spot in the middle surrounded by you know, some tree mortality, but brown trees that um, you know, maybe weren't, uh, weren't killed, um, <clears throat> or there's some interspersed green trees here at least, um, surrounded by areas that didn't burn at all. So you have a very rich mosaic of, of different habitats all within this one area that, that creates these complementary resources for critters like the spotted owl to use uh, for different uh, parts of its life, for traveling through the forest, for hunting, for nesting, et cetera. Uh, and then on the other hand, we have low pyrodiversity. So this, again, it's, it's uh, uh, places that, that predominantly uh, burned at, at high severity. Um, <clears throat> so these high pyrodiversity areas seem to be pretty darn good for owls, whereas the low pyrodiversity areas, not so much. Okay, I'm gonna throw a couple graphs and figures at you. Are you guys scared? You ready for this? <laughs> so um, I like to minimize the you know figures, uh, kind of scientific figures and graphs I show um, uh, in some of these talks. But but I want to show you a couple that are really neat, interesting that I think you'll you guys will, will find um, intriguing. So um, uh, pyrodiversity, this high pyrodiversity across these landscapes. What that really is, what that really is creating is is high heterogeneity, or high variation or variability in forest uh, structure across space. Okay, and one of the things we've discovered through our work is that um, in forests that have high heterogeneity or that are really variable across space, you've got clumps here of forest openings here, you know, very kind of diverse forests. Spotted owls tend to eat more wood rats. So this, this here, I actually didn't put the label on this, uh, this Y axis here, but this is the proportion of spotted owl diet that's made up by these different uh, uh, prey items. So in California, spotted owls eat a lot of wood rats and flying squirrels. And when forests are more diverse in their structure, owls tend to eat a lot more wood rats um, than they do flying squirrels. Um, wood rats are bigger they're kind of the Big Mac of the of the um, the animal world or the spotted owl prey world. So they're big and juicy, and, and they're you know a lot of calories uh, contained in wood rats. And they also occur in high densities. So just you know you find a, a wood rats and they're just everywhere. Um, whereas flying squirrels, they're kind of more like the dollar menu, you know, Mc, Mc, uh, McBurger or chicken or whatever, you know, some type of you know uh, uh, you know less satisfying uh, meal. And they also don't occur in, in as high densities. And so wood rats actually are a really good prey item for spotted owls. And we've found, um, so not only do owls eat more wood rats in places that are more, uh, forests that are more heterogeneous, 
But actually when owls eat more wood rats, so um, now I've flipped the axis a little bit. So as you go from left to right here uh, on this bottom figure, uh, uh, you've got a greater dietary proportion of wood rats. Uh, territories, spotted owl territories are less likely to go extinct. So this actually means that wood rats in spotted owl diets are scaling up to these population level processes. So owls are less likely, these territories are less likely to link off when owls are eating more wood rats. Um, I, I've tried to tell my wife that I just need to eat more Big Macs now and that'll be good for me, right? Because spotted owls like to eat the Big Macs of the, of the prey world, but she hasn't uh, bought into that yet. Um, so anyhow, one of the other interesting things we found is that what owls eat really differs depending on where you look. And so this is all in California here. And, and what I'm showing you here, these are, this is called a density curve. So this is basically just showing you sort of a clump of data. Um, and uh, the, the X axis here, again, across left to right on the bottom, this is showing the proportion of a spotted owl's diet that's made up of wood rats and pocket gophers, which is, um, another critter that we couldn't actually distinguish from, uh, from wood rats in this analysis, but predominantly this group is wood rats. Um, so what I'm showing you here is on national forests that predominantly in California have been fire suppressed and are, are quite homogenous in their structure. Um, owls are eating less uh, wood rats. They have fewer wood rats in their diet on national forests. Um, and remember what happens when you have fewer wood rats? you have higher extinction rates. So it's not so good when you're eating more, or when you're eating fewer wood rats, okay? Um, whereas on national parks, this green sort of uh, arc that you see here, um, they're eating a lot more wood rats. And actually you wanna know where else they're eating a lot more wood rats? On private timberlands. So it turns out that spotted owl diets are quite similar on national parks and on industrial timberlands, which might surprise you. Um, and it also just so happens that we know from other work that I'm not gonna show here, that owl populations are declining on national forests, but they're not declining on national parks, nor on, are they on private timberlands in California that we've measured. So what we've shown is that uh, what we typically think about as being the key factor for spotted owls might be a little different. It's prey is everything. Um, and even when the landscapes look quite different um, or may have different purposes, you know, national parks are quite different from industrial timberlands. Um, it's that forest heterogeneity that provides that key prey habitat that owls are queuing in on that help their populations. So coming back to this figure I showed you before, what we found in our research is that this is indeed what happens when you have a fire suppressed landscape, uh, owl populations are declining. And once the fire comes through, you have these big uh, negative impacts. <clears throat> so where does that leave us? Do we treat the forests? And that's, that's a question that's above my pay grade. I can't, tell you, I can't tell you what to do across large landscapes, but I, I do the science that helps you figure out how to do it if you're gonna do it. Um, so uh, the real question here is how do we implement treatment in a way that doesn't negatively affect spotted owls too much in the short term as we go in and alter some of these forest habitats that are really fire suppressed and homogenous how do we introduce that heterogeneity in a way that is um, that doesn't uh, 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 negatively affect owl habitat in the short term? That's a, a major unopen, uh, 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 open question, unsolved mystery, if you will. But we're still working on it. And one of the ways that we're working on that is through developing what I like to call these living maps of spotted owl habitat. And so what I'm showing you here, this is a, a time series. So you see a whole bunch of little uh, slides here cycling through over and over and over. And I apologize for the really awful color scheme of red and green, it's kind of difficult to look at. Um, but the point here is that uh, this is showing you every uh, uh, spotted owl habitat across a landscape in, in New Mexico, where I'm currently located, uh, where we have the Mexican spotted owl. Um, and it's showing you the distribution of owl habitat across this landscape, this is the Southern Rockies in Northern New Mexico, every year from 1986 through 2020. 
it's a little time series showing you kind of like you know you flip get a little flip book and flip through and see how things change through time but this is this is what we're doing here the green places are are the best spotted owl habitat the red places are the worst and as you can see through time owl habitat is changing it's being affected by fire as you see down here in the middle this fire just popped up other changes are occurring fires are happening probably some harvest of forest here and there that may alter uh, owl habitat. Um, but we're coming up with ways to map spotted owl habitat in a really uh, accurate and powerful way so that we can give this kind of information to managers who are going out to try and restore these forests and reduce fuels and say, these are the places that are the highest quality owl habitat, for example, in some of these drainages um, here. So, you know, maybe these are places to to tread a little more lightly when you're going in and doing some fuels reduction. Whereas these other places where we've mapped uh, lower quality owl habitat, those are places that may be a little safer to go in and alter owl habitat, or alter this forest structure in the short term so as to minimize those potential effects to owls. So this is what I like to call the, the living map. This is one of the ways that, that we're um, mapping owl habitat across space. One of the other things that we're doing is, um, developing these, uh, these mapping tools uh, to, to guide forest restoration in spotted owl packs or protected activity centers. These are uh, administrative units that are drawn um, on US Forest Service land um, where certain activities may be restricted um, uh, uh, in order to protect spotted owl habitat. So one of the things that we're doing is we're using our GPS data that I showed you before to develop these um, these sort of models that we can turn into maps of owl habitat. And so what we can actually do is use the GPS data that I'm showing you over here, these, these gray boundaries here, these are the packed boundaries, these blue crosses are the spotted owl locations. We can develop these, these um, statistical models that will predict across space uh, the, the better and the worse owl habitat within those packs. So if you're gonna go into a pack, which is typically off limits in a lot of ways, if you're gonna go into a pack, to try and create some of that heterogeneity that I was talking about. Um, the red areas are maybe places where you could go, right? Because these are places where owls, our, our, our model tells us are of lower quality for owls because of the forest structure or the topography or, or the local climate or things like that. So we wanna try and create these tools to help us figure out how to treat these landscapes in a way that's gonna be sustainable for spotted owl habitat. So one of the last things I'll leave you with is kind of this interesting depiction of two pathways. You can kind of think of a fork in the road or a, you know, a, a split in, the, in the, the path in the woods or something like that in terms of how we can envision our futures of some of these, these dry forests in the West. One of them is, is, uh, is this sort of idealistic vision of the fire restored forest where we have uh, on the left hand here, this kind of arc of, of images where we have a, a forest structure that we've restored to this really heterogeneous condition with some variety in species and structures, uh, some openings and clumps. This type of uh, structure, it, it really supports the kind of fire that not only provides habitat for spotted owls, but also provides some burned habitat for critters like the black-backed woodpecker, which relies on some of these uh, you know, uh, severely burned forests in, in small quantities. And not only that, but we have more reliable um, uh, 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 sort of smoke pulses that, that may occur in smaller doses. Um, and we also have other benefits to the ecosystem like cleaner water and, and better water uh, quality and, and quantity. The other alternative, sort of the, um, the, uh, the, the darker path, as, as I've heard someone describe it, is sort of the status quo, which is in a lot of ways, um, these fire excluded forests that are really highly dense if we, if we kind of continue down this path, we're gonna be losing habitat for spotted owls, for the blackback woodpecker as well, because these large megafires are actually not so good for even the blackback woodpecker, some recent research has, has shown. We also have greater smoke output, you know, uh, water quality issues, et cetera. So um, really this, this pyrodiversity paradigm, this heterogeneity paradigm, um, is one that benefits not only the ecosystem itself, but also the critters that inhabit it, like the spotted owl and the blackback woodpecker. So I'm gonna be done here in just a minute. 
give us some time to chat if we, if we have some time. But I want to leave you with a couple points because I've given you a lot of information. So let's try to bring it back to the, the key issues that I want you to take home with you. The first is that when it comes to spotted owls, when we have extensive severe fire, big areas that burn severely, that results in territory abandonment and population decline. So that is something we have shown conclusively that these kinds of mega fires that burn really severely across large areas, not good for, for spotted owl populations. The second thing is that it's all about scale. The scale and the configuration of these severely burned forests, that is everything in terms of how it impacts spotted owls. So if someone comes up and tells you, hey, severe fire is good for spotted owls, you can say, well, it depends, actually. It depends on how big those patches are and what they're shaped like. Or likewise, if someone comes up to you and says, hey, I hear severe fires are bad for spotted owls. You can say, well, actually they like small patches. So I want to bring some nuance into your world and help you have some intelligent conversation in this ongoing conservation conflict. Finally, the last thing is that um, there's this idea that is pushed by some people that uh, we can't restore forests or we can't reduce fuels while also conserving spotted owls. Those things are diametrically opposed. And I'm here to tell you that that is way too simplistic. <laughs> um, and the world is not that simple. We can uh, restore forests while conserving owls and their habitat in the long term. That is something we can do. And that's the, the type of science that I've been involved in that I'm working uh, to do is trying to guide us towards real practical solutions to conserving the forests we love as well as the owls that live in them. And with that, I just wanna say thank you so much. I really wish I could be there. Thank you all, all of you for being here virtually. Um, and uh, I really appreciate you sharing your evening with me. So with that, I'll say thanks. Um, here's some contact information for me. Feel free to shoot me an email if you want. If we run out of time, I know we're kind of bumping up here against the end of the hour, um, uh, but I'll leave it at that. Turn it back over to Sabrina. Thank you so much. That was awesome. Learned a lot. Um, so we have a few questions in the chat and the way we normally do it is I just go through and read them for you. Sounds good. So let's see, there's some comments in here. Let me find our first question. Okay, so is the California spotted owl listed under the ESA? It is not. It is um, the Northern and the Mexican subspecies are listed. The California is not. Um, recently it had, there was a petition to list the California subspecies as threatened. And that petition did not go through, but now there's a uh, sort of a, a lawsuit following up to try and get that overturned. So there's, it's not listed yet. All right, let's see. Okay, so this one says, I have a hard time picturing a lot of fire suppression having occurred in the wilderness and back country. It seems they always have and always will focus on saving homes and structures. Isn't climate change the largest thing that has changed fire intensities and sizes as well as the winds? So it is, so just like I said a moment ago, well, it depends. <laughs> and that's almost always the right answer is it's, it's a little bit of both. And where that balance tips in terms of whether fire suppression is the major driver or whether climate is the major driver of how these fires are changing, that really depends on where you look. And so um, there's, if you think about two ends of the spectrum, there's two, two way ends of the spectrum of, of forests. There's dry, dry forests and wet forests, okay? The wet forests have always been climate driven. These, these kinds of, of forests like the Pacific Northwest or high elevation forests that are cool, they almost never burn because they're so cool and so wet. And so every once in a while, when there's a big drought every hundred or couple hundred years, those things go up in flames and they burn like crazy. Uh, and they're always kind of driven by this climate, this top-down climate process. On the other end of the spectrum, you have dry forests. These are the ones that I've been talking about where historically they burn all the time because they're always dry and there's always a little bit of fuel, they always burn. And so fire suppression is gonna have almost no effect on these uh, cool, moist forests in terms of, um, influencing fire behavior. But in the dry forests, it's a totally different story. 
And so it's, it's, the answer is it's always a little bit of both, uh, especially in, well, in dry forests, it's always a little bit of both, right? So we, fire suppression has absolutely changed for a structure. It produces a lot more fuel in the landscape. And you know, if you have if you have more fuel, you're, if you don't have fuel, you're not going to have as much of a fire. If you have more fuel, you're going to have more fire. It's kind of basic, um, but climate has climate change has certainly exacerbated some of those conditions, dried out the fuel more, um, and certainly you know extreme fire uh, conditions, uh, you know high winds and things like that. Um, all the the balance of the factors that drive fire it changes in those those kinds of circumstances. Um, so it's, it's always a little bit of both, but in some forests like the dry forests, we have a lot more control over fire behavior through management actions. Um, so uh, that's why, you know, and there's quite a bit of evidence actually, scientific evidence that fuels reduction, uh, forest thinning, things like that can alter fire behavior even under severe uh, fire weather conditions. Okay. <laughs> Did, did someone? Oh, sorry, I'm hearing my own feedback. I thought someone was speaking. Here, I'll, I'll, I'll mute myself just in case that's me, Sabrina. Okay. All right. The next question along the theme of climate change, with large swaths of forest dying from bark beetle and drought, do you have a sense for how these kinds of changes are impacting the owls and other forest wildlife? Just wondering if it might be helping by opening up forests and patches or acting more like severe fire damage. Great, great, great question. Yeah. So, you know, to be blunt, we just don't have as much data yet on how that, you know, we don't have empirical data on, on how those, uh, you know, beetle outbreaks and, and, and drought um, mortality have affected owls. We're, we're working on that. We do have some data, it's not out yet. Um, but the evidence that I've seen, at least in the Southern Sierra Nevada, where I've been doing some work, um, is that drought mortality uh, and beetle mortality tend to be more patchy. Um, so, you know, we don't have these sort of big blocky, uh, you know, uh, patches of, of, of uh, tree, you know, tree mortality like we do from the King Fire in places that we had some drought mortality or beetle mortality. So if I were to hazard a guess, and I, I promise you this is just a guess, um, so take everything I say with a uh, grain of salt, but, you know, I, I, I would guess that there, there could certainly, there's possibility that, that those types of disturbances in some cases could introduce some heterogeneity that is beneficial, you know, just like fire does. Um, so, uh, but I would say the jury is out on that one for sure. But, you know, snags, dead trees, those can be really good for, for owls um, and other critters uh, um, uh, in these forests. So I, I wouldn't at all be surprised that it's a similar story in some cases, in some contexts, drought or, uh, you know, drought mortality or beetle mortality could, could uh, have positive beneficial effects to the owl, but in other cases, maybe not. All right, next question. What impediments are conservationists facing in getting the California subspecies listed as threatened? So um, I'll say that the, the, the decision to list a species as threatened, um, I would say that's above my pay grade and somewhat in the political realm. Um, so I don't really wanna speak to sort of, you know, the the inherent uh, or the implied sort of the, uh, you know the owl should or should not be listed uh, under the Endangered Species Act, but I will say that there are multiple threats that the owls are facing, and those include fire, increasing fire uh, frequency uh, or rather severity. Um, you have a potential uh, invasion of the Sierra Nevada by the barred owl. Um, you have, uh, there's quite a bit of evidence recently, pretty disheartening evidence actually, that um, there's uh, widespread anticoagulant rodenticide poisoning in, in owls and a lot of other wildlife in, in the Sierra Nevada and in California. Uh, so this is, this is um, basically uh, rodenticide that's used in illegal uh, marijuana grow operations in, um, in forests. So, you know, people put out a ton of rodenticide and ends up poisoning some, you know, critters, sublethal levels that are then eaten by owls or other animals. And that accumulates up the food chain and has some pretty severe uh, negative impacts to, to owls. 
um, and other uh, animals. And so the owl certainly is facing a lot of threats. Um, I would say that there's a lot of, um, you know, well, frankly, in, in conservation biology, there, it's, it's often a grim picture that we see in front of us. But I will say there's, you know, both uh, some serious threats for, for the owl in, in the decades to come that I just mentioned. But I think there's also a lot of hope, um, even under the current uh, sort of paradigm of, of, of conservation for the owl. Um, so, you know, we've shown that uh, in some other work that I had, didn't share here today that we actually, forest restoration that I was suggesting can have some serious benefits to owls over the long term um, in, in terms of reducing severe fire uh, 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 exposure. Um, there was actually a paper just published today uh, that I was not a part of, but some of my colleagues were, where they showed that they actually successfully removed uh, barred owls from the northern Sierra Nevada. So an invasive species removal, a lethal removal program uh, in the northern Sierra Nevada, uh, where they actually were able to remove essentially all of the barred owls in the Sierra Nevada. So therefore, more or less saving the spotted owl from imminent <laughs> uh, extirpation from the barred, from its competitor, the barred owl. Very controversial stuff, but nevertheless, from the spotted owl's perspective, um, you know, there's some reason to be optimistic, I, I would say. So I know I really squirreled around that question. But I don't really want to wade into the, the, um, the question of whether the owl should or should not be listed. That's not my, that's, I'm, I'm the scientist. I'm not the, the, the policymaker, so. Yeah, I have a um, family friend who works for Fish and Wildlife and she was actually involved with the, um, the removal of that. Yeah, oh, interesting stuff. Yeah. Um, okay, so got lost here a little bit. Um, I imagine that regeneration of habitat, be it severe fire or bark beetle, will be based upon rainfall. Back to climate change without rainfall, regeneration is limited. Um, I think that's more of a comment. Okay, sorry, I skipped a question here. So do spotted owls prefer dry forests then? What determines their preference? Finally, how can you tell if a forest is dry or wet? <laughs> Great question. Um, so, I mean, spotted owls live in all sorts of forests. You know, they live in dry forests where there are dry forests, and they live in wet forests where there are wet forests. So, up in the Pacific Northwest, uh, especially like on the western slope of the Cascades, that stuff's all wet forest pretty much. Um, and so, uh, you know, and, and in fact, if, if you were to just close your eyes and picture spotted owl habitat, the first thing that comes to your mind would probably be a, a wet forest, you know trees that are just covered in moss, like, you know, really dark and wet, like that's, you know, owls, spotted owls live there too. Um, and it's, it's just a, those, you know, uh, wet forests don't occur everywhere. Yet, uh, you know, dry forests that owls inhabit in, in California, um, you know, it, it, it really, it, it really, the limiting factor is nesting structures. And so, um, you know, as long as you have these big old decadent you know, trees um, that they can nest in um, and you've got sufficient prey, you know, that can occur in both dry and wet forests. I'm down in, in New Mexico now in Albuquerque and we've got the Mexican spotted owl. And there's some pretty weird things about the Mexican spotted owl that have opened my eyes to sort of what these factors are that drive owl habitat. Mexican spotted owls, some of them don't even nest in trees. They nest in caves or in cliffs or in rock faces, you know? And so, you know, really it's, it's you need some type of, of semi-permanent nest structure. It's very guarded from the environment and you need some, uh, you know, surrounding habitat for your prey. But owls, spotted owls will live in, in all sorts of places as long as those elements are present. And predominantly we see, we see those in, you know, mixed conifer, both forests, both dry and wet, but also kind of in these strange canyon lands down here in, in the Southwest, so. Um, and then in terms of where you split the dry from wet forests, that is a fantastic question. And I would say that you could get 10 forest ecologists in the room and they'd all argue about it for weeks and weeks and weeks. I mean, it's a really a continuum, right? Uh, it's not a, a binary, well, this forest is definitely dry and this is definitely wet, but everything exists still along this continuum. Um, so <laughs> that's, that's about all, I'll, I'll leave it there. <laughs> 
Okay, next question. Um, do spotted owls only use old, old growth? So it would take a long time to regenerate their habitats, right? Yeah, so um, predominantly, yeah, you know, what we understand about, about owl habitat from decades of study is that, you know, the places where they nest tend to have pretty big and old trees. Now, from time to time, they, they nest in forests that may not be characterized as, you know, super old, but maybe have those adequate structures. Um, and I would say, you know, one thing we know is that we have less, we have fewer large trees, large old trees now than we did 100 years ago. Um, and the type of habitat that owls are using now probably looks quite a bit different than it did, you know, back in the day. Um, and so, you know, uh, I've, I've got a little bit of a pet hypothesis that um, that spotted owls in a lot of places are actually using suboptimal habitat. Um, that the habitat that they're sort of more or less forced to inhabit may not be sort of their evolutionarily optimal habitat, yet it's good enough to, to help them get by. So yeah, owls, owls are pretty much old forest obligates. But that's really when it comes to nesting. Um, now, when it comes to foraging and other kinds of activities, you know, they'll, they'll use more types of habitat uh, than just old forest. But the key is, is that, that, that nest site structure that is typically provided by these large old trees and in, in old growth forests. Okay. Sorry if you can hear the train in the background. It's going to my house. Oh, good. <laughs> um, all right, we have a couple questions about the barred owls. Um, so someone asked what happened to the barred owls that were removed, and then also what caused the influx of barred owls into spotted owl habitat? So, um, the barred owls that were removed, again, I'll just mention, I wasn't involved in the study. Um, so, you know, I'd encourage you to, I'm sure that you can Google this. There's probably some press releases and things that came out today about this particular topic and get you more accurate information. But um, from what I understand, um, you know, these, these barred owls were, were lethally removed. Um, and then once they were uh, removed, they were, uh, you know, brought to the to a museum uh, to be specimens in, in other future research, you know, or in, in ongoing or future research studies. You know, there's been some studies going on a barred owl diet. Those owls were used to study the prevalence of, of anticoagulant rodenticides, um, things like that. So there's, you know, there's a real scientific purpose uh, to collecting those, uh, those barred owls with the benefit of, uh, you know, from the spotted owls perspective, removing them as competitors from the landscape. Um, and then uh, in terms of causing the influx, so if you're familiar with, with you know, what's been going on in the Pacific Northwest is, um, you know, I mentioned the Northwest Forest Plan, you know, that's put in place several decades ago. That's been actually pretty successful at conserving these large blocks of, of habitat, um, at least, you know, uh, uh, reasonably successful. Um, however, uh, spotted owl populations up there, northern spotted owls have tanked. Uh, in the past couple of decades. And that's been predominantly because the barred owl uh, has been increasing in density like just crazy uh, up there. And so in some places you've got like five barred owls for every one spotted owl in the landscape. You know, they can really pack in at high densities. And so up in the Pacific Northwest, Washington, Oregon, and even in Northern California, you have a lot of barred owls. However, um, they've, they've kind of been uh, unable to break into the Sierra Nevada because of this really unique geography in, in the, uh, up there between the, the split between the range of the Northern Spotted Owl and the California Spotted Owl. There's kind of this like very narrow uh, uh, place where uh, there's this connection, like habitat connection, um, where barred owls may be able to disperse down into the Sierra Nevada. Um, because of that, it's been this really slow trickle. It's like a faucet, you just barely turn on, it's a drip, 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 just barely, you know, any barred owls coming into the Sierra Nevada. Um, but this is the typical way that biological invasions happen. You have a slow trickle of individuals, whether it's plant species or animal species invading a new habitat, you have a slow trickle and then all of a sudden, it's like a switch flips and you have this rapid exponential growth in, um, in that uh, the population of, of that species. And that's exactly what started to happen with the barn owls in, in the Sierra Nevada. So a couple of years back, one of my colleagues, Connor Wood at the University of Wisconsin published 
a paper showing. Uh, looks like we're starting the exponential growth phase for barred owls in the, in the Sierra Nevada. This is concerning because we know how bad that's been for the northern spotted owl. And so that precipitated the scientific study uh, to, to look at the removal effectiveness. And it's, it was pretty darn effective. So, so that's kind of how they trickled into the Sierra Nevada um, and, and why their populations got big. That's kind of a natural uh, part of the invasion process. All right, so we have one more question, but I don't want to skip Deborah's comment. Um, Deborah said that she did Mexican spotted owl surveys in Colorado canyons. Cool. That's, that's then, a lot of fun. Uh, uh, um, I want to ask Deborah if she if she walked around the woods hooting hooting to, uh, to the owls at night by herself. <laughs> that's the traditional spotted owl survey method. You just walk around and hoot in the woods. We did. We actually did have to learn to hoot and we were out after dark, you know, of course, with headlamps and stumbling around these canyons with the mountain lions, probably. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, sounds familiar to me. I'm, I'm glad you had that experience, Deborah. Very cool. Yeah, it was fun learning to hoot for sure. <laughs> All right. Our last question here. Have there been attempts to use artificial nest boxes? Not that it would be a long term solution. You know, not that I know of. I've heard that question before, and yeah, I don't, I don't, uh, not for spotted owls, not that I know of. It's possible that I, I haven't heard about it, but you're right. You know, it's, it's kind of, it's one of those tricky things. It's like, well, <laughs> remember that, that kind of silly comic I showed you before about the timber industry's alternative for spotted owl habitat, where you just have, you know, bird baths or whatever. It's like, you know, once you kind of bring in that artificial intervention, it's like, you know, it's, some people might view it as an excuse to, oh, well, we don't even need the trees anyway. We can just put the nest boxes in. So I don't know if that's part of it or not, but, but yeah, it's certainly not a long-term solution. Um, and I'm not aware of any studies that have looked at effectiveness uh, for, for spotted owls. Yeah. All right. Well, that was our last question. Um, if anyone else wants to unmute and you know have any comments or last-minute questions, feel free. But otherwise, thank you so much. That was really informative and really cool. I love all the pictures. Great. Well, hey, thank you, Sabrina, for the invitation. Thank you, Cynthia, as well. Um, this has been a real pleasure. And uh, I hope you guys learned something and had a good time.